But if you have any questions, just feel free to ask. It's always, it's always uh, Bronchitis. So we're doing bronchitis, bronchiolitis, and croup. These are some of the most common um, uh, respiratory illnesses you're going to see in a variety of settings, settings emergency medicine, uh, primary care, urgent care, uh, whatever. So we'll start out with bronchitis. So viral respiratory tract infection, bronchitis is typically self-limiting. Self-limiting is the big key there. Uh, again. Viral etiology, flu, paraflu, coronavirus, rhinovirus are your typical players. I mean, there's about a thousand different viruses out there that can cause all sorts of respiratory problems. Um, there's no significant evidence that is suggesting a bacterial cause. Now, that's going to be key in our treatment. So, um, typically, these acute bronchitis are not bacterial in origin, um, except for a few. Uh, exceptions of airway abnormalities and if, you get, if you're intubated you have a tracheostomy or some kind of upper airway abnormality uh, that could predispose you to a bacterial uh, bronchitis but in your normal everyday population uh, it's a self-limiting viral disease. So uh, inflammation of the bronchi against the term bronchitis, you know, kind of pretty self-explanatory. Uh, cough. Uh, the cough can last up to one to two weeks, sometimes longer. So, I mean, I've seen bronchitis these last four to six weeks. Sometimes they just have this chronic cough, and sometimes it's hard to get the body to clear that sputum, mucus, and swapped off epithelial cells from your mainstem bronchus and upper airways. And it can, it can go on for a while sometimes um, and still be non-bacterial, uh, even though if it goes for long enough or if it or signs and symptoms, cough, with or without sputum production, airway congestion, wheezing, um, bronchi that clears with cough. You know, it's so hard. You, there's not a lot of these signs and symptoms that are going to be specific. So don't, you know, key in on one of those. Well, if they don't have wheezing, then it's not bronchitis. Or if their bronchi don't clear, then it's not bronchitis. You know what I mean? It, you can't do that with these sort of things. These are just some generalized type deal. I hope you don't mind me standing right by you. It's the biggest TV, yeah. Um, so uh, the big thing uh, be for us are going to be differentiating between bronchitis and pneumonia. Sometimes that's a little difficult. There are some specific, uh, there are some general scheme, scheme that you can kind of look at uh, to try to help differentiate between the two. Um, and I have them here on this list and then in your handout as well. So your bronchitis people are typically afebrile. Um, and you know, and obviously, and you're going to see throughout my lectures I'm going to have typically or sometimes or generally. And that does not mean always. There's never anything always. If anybody tries to explain to you in medicine that 100% of the time this happens, they're not doing you very uh, good teaching because there's never 100% for any pain medicine. There's always degrees of uh, variability. So typically afebrile for bronchitis and typically have fever, which no, no, I'll give it not all the time. So uh, I say one of the bigger ones is the lack of systemic symptoms of bronchitis. You know, you're typically not going to see the chills, rigors, appetite, mental status changes, uh, things like that. Uh, you know, bronchitis clears. Versus bronchi that's consistent, that's, I mean, pretty nonspecific too, but sometimes you'll see those in board questions or test questions, uh, so you can kind of key in on that. You know, percussion, egophony, you guys gone over those? So, yeah, I mean, I don't know anybody that's ever done those before in their life, but sure. <laughs> Call this a percussion, you know, but uh, you can rotate with me, I want you to do egophony. I'm definitely going to ask you about that. Um, and so your labs uh, typically are remarkable with bronchitis, and sometimes you'll have abnormal labs with pneumonia, but not all the time. You know. um, so those are some kind of helpful hints to try to differentiate between the two. Um, so your diagnosis are mostly bronchitis, just clinical diagnosis. You don't really need lab, you don't need x-rays for it. Um, sometimes radiology are helpful to help differentiate the two if you're having a tough time going back and forth. Um, so, most of the time it's just going to be figuring out when you need to order a chest x-ray to differentiate between uh, bronchitis and pneumonia. Um, 
in these, to me, some of the bigger ones are going to be your vital signs. Now, I come and I lecture to you guys here in, I don't know, probably 11 months or something like that uh, over emergency medicine, and I'm going to have a big, huge spiel about vital signs, and I'm going to get on top of that desk, and I'm going to yell at you about vital signs, and I'm going to tell you how important they are and how you need to know them and how much they're going to uh, change your clinical decision making and then the six of you guys that come rotate with me the next following year in emergency medicine you're going to come present a case to me and I'm actually okay well what's their heart rate? Uh, what's their oxygen saturation? Mm, I don't have that. And then I'm going to yell at you because <laughs> vital signs are important. There's a big difference between somebody who has some cough and congestion, a little coarse respiratory sounds that has a heart rate of 89 or a heart rate of 16, sat in 100% on the room air and say febra, versus somebody who has those exact same symptoms, who has a heart rate of 120 or a heart rate of 22, sat in 90 or 89% or 91% and has a 104 degree fever. There's a big difference in your workup between those two. And so uh, vital signs for me are one of the most important things to differentiate between when I'm gonna order a chest x-ray or not. Uh, abnormal vital signs for somebody who has upper respiratory type symptoms gets chest x-ray. I think that that's um, prudent to differentiate between bronchitis and pneumonia because pneumonia needs antibiotics, bronchitis does not. Um, and then obviously severity of symptoms and length of, uh, length of symptoms too. I mean, if they had a cough for a month, I think would you know, prompt you to get a chest x-ray even if their vital signs were normal. But in an acute setting, I think uh, vital signs Okay, so obviously, well, it's not really coming up that well on this uh, picture here, but have you guys done radiology yet? No. Yeah. Okay. Um, so you can see here, uh, obviously, pneumonia, bronchitis. You know, you can see some consolidated uh, infiltrate here in this right middle lobe um, versus, you know, just some increased uh, interstitial markings here, but no acute consolidation. <coughs> Perihilar congestion. I mean, I, you know, I would almost probably read that X-ray as normal, not even perihilar congestion. That's a pretty subjective thing to see. I've seen some pretty shitty X-rays that a, a radiologist said normal. And I was like, okay. uh, <laughs> whatever you want. Uh, so what you can see here: clear heart borders. Your diaphragmatic sulci uh, are clear. There's no acute consolidations. Um, there's no real patchy infiltrates uh, versus here. Obviously, you losing that medial heart border here and a little bit of your costophrenic sulci here is kind of gone. So you can see how this is obviously in the mode versus uh, bronchitis um, to have to differentiate between the two of those. Lab workup, I mean, you're not really going to do much labs for a true bronchitis. Uh, you know, white blood cell count, some people can get that and they're like, oh, they have an elevated white blood cell count. That means they have pneumonia. Absolutely not. Wrong. 100% wrong. Don't. Don't even think about that. Now, I have been told, and I, I guess I need to clarify on some of my <laughs> lectures that I give here, because uh, I sometimes come down hard on white blood cell counts and CBCs, because I think that you know, they're not as important as what a lot of people lay claim to them. But mm -hmm. if you need to order it, go ahead and order it. I've had some students come rotate with me and order every lab in the book except for a CBC. And I'm like, well, why don't you want to order that? It's like the most common thing. Like, well, you said not to. I didn't, I'm not saying not order it. I'm just saying don't, you know, bet the house on what the results of a CBC are going to come back as. So just because somebody has an elevated white blood cell count does not mean they have a severe systemic infection or pneumonia for that matter. Um, it's an imperfect test. There are a lot of different things that can influence the white blood cell count. Um, some of your chronic uh, upper respiratory type people. Damn, I lost one. <laughs> <laughs> your chronic upper respiratory people that take a lot of albuterol treatments and things like that. Albuterol can cause white blood cell demarginalization. And so you have a preponderance of white blood cells in your uh, bloodstream just from the albuterol that can falsely elevate it in the absence of infection. Um, did you guys take a lab medicine yet? Just throughout. Throughout, okay. Yeah. Well, whoever talks about that, we'll talk about uh, looking at your white blood cell differential and how to look for left shifts and uh, preponderance of neutrophils and things like that that can help differentiate what and, uh, you know, 
and falsely elevate a white blood cell count versus something that's more indicative of infection. So you can get a white blood cell count. It's an imperfect test. Don't really need it. Uh, Procalcitonin here. You know, I put this in here when I first made this. You, you, you never know where procalcitonin is for bronchitis. Uh, but it's sometimes helpful in distinguishing between a viral and a bacterial etiology uh, in suspected chest x-rays. Um, but whoever lectures to you over pneumonia um, can go in more detail about procalcitonin and, and its functions in differentiating between um, uh, bacterial versus viral. Um, it's helpful in that, not necessarily specific. It's a little bit better in determining the severity of sepsis, but whoever lectures to you, I can go in more detail. Uh, treatment is, is symptomatic treatment. It's NSAIDs, decongestants, antihistamines, antitussives, mucolytic, bronchodilators, steroids. There's really not a whole lot of research that says either one of those is better than the other. Uh, you know, you can do your typical Medrol dose pack and give that to everybody just so they can say they got something. Doesn't necessarily help. It's a self-limiting disease. It should go. It should go away, um, in you know, five to seven days, uh, typically. Um, so you know, just treating their symptoms. You know, drying their nasal uh, sinuses up with some antihistamines and decongestants so they can help that post test and cough and things like that. Um, but, I mean, it's just your typical kind of symptomatic treatment. Every single one of those is over the counter except for the uh, steroids, um, oral steroids, anyway, so you can say nasal steroids. Um, so, I mean, a lot of these people can just treat themselves, but we'll see them when they treat them all the time. Uh, antibiotics, <laughs> don't do it! It's capitalized, lots of exclamation points. Uh, it's a viral etiology, it's a virus. It does not need antibiotics. Now, I guarantee you, every single one of you here in, in school, at one point in your career, will write antibiotics for bronchitis. I do it all the time. It's, you know, I, I hate doing it, but it's just sometimes patients want their antibiotics or they're going to scream and shout, so we just get into it. But try your best to not do it. Try to focus on some antibacterial stewardship so, you know, uh, we don't have um, the bugs that are rolling around now that are so resistant. I was reading a paper the other day um, about the resistance of strep pneumo to Zithromax now. It's starting to become more and more resistant, so that typical give them a Z-Pack, see you later type thing is starting to come back and bite us in the butt. And uh, Zithromax isn't working as well for strep pneumo, which is known one cause for a lot of your upper respiratory and pneumonia type things. Um, so I think uh, here in the next uh, you know year or two, the treatment guidelines for community acquired pneumonia I don't think are going to include um, Zithromax and a uh, beta lactam anymore. I think it's going to change up a little bit because there's a lot of resistance to it now. But that's a different lecture. Anyways, so do your best not to do antibiotics. Uh, that being said, there are some indications for when antibiotics can be used, and that's for the old and firm. You get some 90-year-old there that's coughing and hacking, chin congested, got bronchitis, not looking too good. You just give her some antibiotics. They can take a turn for the worse. Uh, same thing for people you know, who have tracheostomies or chronically intubated and things like that. Um, or uh, indicated for antibiotics is if it's greater than seven to 10 days, I typically go 10 days. They've had 10 days worth of infection and it's not resolving on its own. There is some evidence to support that there could be a bacterial uh, infection superimposed upon that viral bronchitis. So you get the virus, it kind of decreases your body's ability to mobilize the secretions, and then you get uh, it kind of creates a perfect medium for bacterial growth. Uh, and then your uh, pathogens here, strep pneumo, H, flu, and cat, there's going to be some things you're going to see a lot of times over and over again. Um, and uh, yeah, I put some handouts in your, uh, or some antibiotics in your handouts, but um, I'm sure whoever lectures over to you, pneumonia, can discuss the antibiotics lecture a little bit better. Any questions over bronchitis? Okay, uh, bronchiolitis. So this is a lower respiratory tract. So we're starting to move down um, the tree in your bronchi to your uh, bronchioles. 
Uh, lower respiratory tract infection result in edema, mucus accumulation in the distal airways. Um, this is more of a younger kid uh, type illness, uh, child and infant. Um, but it, you'd be surprised that we've actually, so in Mercy we just have, we have this new viral respiratory PCR panel uh, that we do a swab and it does genetic testing. Um, do PCR to look for a bunch of different viruses. And I've been seeing a ton of adults with RSV. It's, it, it is crazy. It used to be kind of just say, oh, RSV is a kid thing. Uh, but I've seen a lot of older adults uh, with RSV. So it's kind of bizarre. But anyways, uh, RSV is your n number one most common. So whenever they say RSV, that means bronchiolitis. When they say bronchiolitis, they mean RSV. It's the same thing. Those two are basically synonymous. Uh, but there are a few other viral components that can cause uh, bronchiolitis as well. Um, so again, typically it affects infants and children under two years old. It's predominantly a fall and winter season, so you'll hear a lot of people talk about uh, RSV season, flu season, these are typically. So you're not going to see a whole lot of RSV in the summer and the spring and things like that. Um, some risk factors for, the, for getting a prematurity. Um, under three months of age, congenital disease, people who have, uh, you know, little kids have cerebral palsy or you know, compromise or things like that, kids getting cancer, um, they be predisposed to get those types of things. So again, pathogenesis of the terminal bronchi, uh, get some swelling, inflammation, the mucus uh, around those areas kind of coats them and kind of inhibits uh, gas exchange um, on the bronchial level, not necessarily on the alveolar level. Uh, typically starts up respiratory tract symptoms, cough, congestion, rhinorrhea, carousa, uh, progressing to fever, cough, and respiratory stress, depending on the severity of the illness. Um, so there, I mean, there's a pretty big continuum on bronchiolitis. Um, you know, mild rhinorrhea and congestion to needing to intubate a baby for respiratory failure. <coughs> I've seen, I've seen it all. You know, it kind of all depends on the severity of disease. So. Uh, there's a few things you can have, wheezing, crackles, retractions, nasal flaring, grunting, tipping up. Um, and associated complications, dehydration, respiratory failure, dehydration because the kids are sick, they don't want to eat as much, they're having some concomitant <coughs> vomiting or diarrhea associated with their viral illness um, that can cause a dehydration as well. Kind of hard to eat when you're a baby, if you're bottle fed or breast fed, when you can't breathe. You don't want to eat as much if you can't breathe because obviously you got to uh, breathe through your nose a little bit whenever you're feeding, and if your nose and airways are so congested and you can't get any oxygen air through them, you're not going to want to feed, so then you become dehydrated. Uh, I'm just going to have some videos here. I think these are some videos on respiratory distress. Good luck. Have you guys seen them already? Or? Hey. Don't doubt me and my technique. <laughs> <laughs> now I can just get some music on up here. Yeah. <laughs> not music, the sound. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and it's gone. <laughs> 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 see if this has. I don't think we've ever been able to make it work. No yeah. one's ever been able to make it work. Oh, <laughs> uh, we have. <laughs> Well, because would you like to oh yeah, There's well a, that was a Blu-ray, but that's right. Some of the videos that I I need sound to display what I'm watching. Is it? Okay, well let's let's. Well, there should be sound. So these are intercostal retractions right here. So you see, yeah, uh, this uh, a little bit of abdominal breathing. These intercostal retractions here. These are pretty typical uh, for signs of respiratory distress. Um, Kind of hard to get this whole baby to cooperate. Um, you can see some a uh, little bit of uh, supraclavicular uh, retractions here. So these are signs of increased uh, work of breathing for a young infant. Uh, you, know, you can't ask somebody you can't talk if they're having trouble breathing. Um, so these are pretty. And you see a little bit more uh, pronounced abdominal breathing here using this abdominal musculature to try to really pull that diaphragm down to pull in more um, uh, air. Uh, so that's kind of typical of that too. 
So that was kind of a milder case versus this was a, you know, this right here is impending respiratory failure. If you see a kid coming in looking like that, you, you need to get an airway stuff set up. You need to be getting your RSI stuff. And obviously, I think this is, I mean, this looks like it's somewhere kind of third world-ish. Uh, but I think, you know, they're fixing to intubate that kid. Yeah, older kid. Their stuff. So, I mean, this is, this is pretty severe respiratory stress. Abdominal breathing, intercostal, supraclavicular uh, retractions. Um, you know, his respiratory rates through the roof. And this is a little bit bigger kid. This looks like he's probably about four or five. Um, so you see, uh, this is this is not a good sign. So those are some things that we want to be aware of um, whenever we're looking at these kids. And you got to get their shirts off when you see them. You won't be able to see that stuff through the shirt. You know, a lot. Of, I know a lot of times we'll listen and also take through the shirt and whatever. Um, I do too. But for these infants, you got it. You got to take their clothes off. You got to get their shirts off. And especially when these ones that are wearing the onesies that button down in the crotch, you got to open it up and pull it open and look at them. Um, and that also helps aid you for looking for uh, rashes too. Uh, so, you know, fever, rash, respiratory complaints, not really a good sign in a kid. But anyway, so you gotta 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 expose their body to look at that to see those types of um, retractions. So uh, chest X-ray not routinely needed uh, except for severe cases. So you know, obviously those other two kids, you see them, you're getting a chest X-ray um, again. Non-specific findings, patchy infiltrate, peritonal congestion. Uh, peribronchial cupping is fairly specific for bronchiolitis. Uh, we'll go over that. So that's kind of one of those like, you know, ding ding words. You hear, you see peribronchial cupping, you should think bronchiolitis, RSV. Um, I'm certain you're going to see that on a test at some point, whether it's here in this thing or your boards or whatever certifications you have. Uh, you're going to see that somewhere. Uh, RSV rapid antigen chest, it's a nasal swab, quick, non-invasive, um, narrow pharyngeal swab, test and see. You know, I, you know, I think the more and more I've been doing this and the more and more kids I see, the less and less I order these swabs. I just don't do it. I've tested probably four people for the flu this year and I've diagnosed hundreds of them with it. It's just, it doesn't, it doesn't add any benefit for me to say, that this kid has a viral upper respiratory tract infection, oh, it's RSV, or oh, it's paraflu, or oh, it's rhinovirus, or oh, it's influenza. If your treatment's gonna be the same, I'm not gonna order a test and do anything that's not gonna change anything. But that's just me. Other people, they routinely come in, flu, RSV, swap, everybody. And that's not wrong. That's just the way they do things. So, you know, there is a test for it. I don't really order it that much unless the you know family's freaking out. They really want something. But um, so here's X-ray perihilar congestion again. You know, I don't think it's it's hard to get images of perihilar congestion because it's kind of a subjective thing. If I was looking at this X-ray, I, I mean, I'd read that as stone cold wrong. I still think so. But um, what are these things? Right? What are those two lines? Those lateral lines going up and down to the side? You see what I'm talking about? Yeah. yeah. What are those? Yeah, oxygen tubing. No. <laughs> Nothing special. It's just oxygen tubing. <laughs> um, I had a chest x ray done the other night uh, whenever I was work. And in ADA, they do their telemetry monitoring is like basically a 12 lead. Like they have wires, uh, it leads everywhere for their telemetry because that's the way they do their EKGs. <laughs> and some joker radiology tech came in and shot a chest x-ray with all those on. And it was literally like 10 wires across this entire chest. Like, how am I supposed to interpret anything like Worms, that? You have long worms. Wires. Anyways, OK, so right here, this is peribronchial cuffing right here. So you see that kind of hyperdense uh, annular lesion with that more clear, um, less dense central area, that's peribronchial cupping. And you'll see that because it's the, that's, a, that's a bronchus that's pointed straight at you. So you're not going to see that on the ones that go out laterally because an x-ray takes a, that three-dimensional image and compresses it flat. So you're not going to see those cross sections unless they're the ones coming straight at you. And that's what that is. Um, so you see that, that is, I mean, that's like one of the best images of peribronchial cupping you're ever going to see right there. You can kind of see a few 
right here in this image, right here, right? Look like little circles, very bronchial cupping. Those are consistent with bronchiolitis. Uh, severity assessment, so we kind of did the videos on um, respiratory distress on your physical exam and then obviously your vital signs, somebody who's hypoxic or has a really fast respiratory rate, those are important. Um, uh, frequent reevaluations of uh, these kids are needed to um, see improvement or decomposition, decomposition, or decomposition, sorry. Um, and I've, I've had some kids, you know, they look fairly good, but maybe kind of more like hypoxic, and then uh, sent them to um, Integris uh, Hospital. And I got a friend of mine who's a pediatric hospitalist over there, and sent me a picture. He was intubating that kid, but five hours later. So that's not that's that's not the kid you don't want to send home because that's the kid that dies at home because five mm -hmm. hours later he's in respiratory failure. Anyway, so that's what your frequent reevaluations are for. And then your indications for hospitalization, your toxic appearance, lethargy, dehydration, respiratory stress, hypoxia, things like that. Uh, treatment, you know, non-severe, just is symptomatic. These things last three to five days. They, they're self-limiting. They just run the course. So nasal suctioning is a big thing. You've got to clear out all that upper airway congestion stuff, and that'll make them sound a lot better so the moms aren't freaking out about, you know, that sound that their kids are breathing from. Uh, fluids, tolerance for fever. Uh, there's really no benefit to albuterol and steroids in bronchiolitis. All the research in the world says that it doesn't really do any good. I still, every once in a while, give those kids a breathing treatment in the emergency department to kind of help tune them up a little bit and see if it helps. Um, you know, but the <coughs> self limiting disease is really not a lot of benefit to it. Um, severe treatment, again, like I said about the breathing treatment, you know, I, I think that's ubiquitous as far as in practice, but in research, the albuterol doesn't really say that, that it helps very much for bronchiolitis. You can do some nebulized hypertonic saline to help kind of mobilize some of those secretions. That, again, I mean, the research doesn't say a whole lot about that either. Uh, oral steroids, again, you can give them, but it's not really going to help uh, or harm. Um, the kiddo. So supplemental oxygen is <coughs> the thing and supportive care. Uh, IV fluids, nutrition monitoring, things like that. You just gotta kinda let it run its course. It's just, you know, not a lot you can do about it. You just gotta support them clinically and um, hope that the body just kind of takes over and uh, heals itself. Um, but I mean you're not gonna be wrong to give a kid a bronchiolitis RSD kid a breathing treatment or a dose of Decatron. You're not gonna be wrong for doing that. Uh, reduce transmissions, hand washing, Jesus, I mean, everybody should know that. Uh, Immuno prophylaxis, so they have um, uh, a prophylactic <coughs> RSV medicine that they can give kids, um, but that's typically reserved fro. Yes, I meant to put that in there. Fro, not for. <laughs> uh, kids that are born premature or have some kind of bronchopulmonary dysplasia, some kind of uh, respiratory insult that would leave them predisposed to getting RSV and then having a bad outcome. Um, so you're not ubiquitously giving um, whatever the hell that word is, the PAL-1. Uh, some, something that, some monoclonal antibody, that's the only thing I remember from pharmacology, and maybe since monoclonal antibody will be information for you. <laughs> so when you're whatever the pharmacology lecture is coming, what does MAP stand for? Yeah. You're welcome. All right, any other questions? Bronchiolitis, RSV. Okay, it's pretty easy. Uh, okay, so croup. Um, so croup is a variety of different um, <coughs> respiratory conditions that kind of produce this characteristic uh, inspiratory strider and hoarseness, barky cough. Um, it, it, most common is viral infection is paraflu. So, <coughs> Ding, 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 board question, test question, what is the etiology of group, parent-influence virus. Uh, typically, six to 36 months of age, three to five day course of illness. Um, uh, clinical features, uh, anatomic hallmark is narrowing of the trachea, the subglottic region of the airway. So, and that, you know, lindriotracheal bronchitis is another uh, thing you kind of call crew. 
to. Um, barky cough, seal bark. So that's going to be in your thing. If you hear croup cough enough, you'll be able to hear it from, you know, walking into the triage area. You can hear a kid cough once and you, I mean, you can just like, all right, I'm done, it's croup. You know, you know, you spend three seconds in that room and it's just learning to kind of hear that and see what it sounds like. Um, you know, it's described as a is a, a, a deep, barky cough, a seal bark. I don't, I don't know what this, I don't know if I've ever heard a seal bark before, but I use that to describe it all the time. Does it sound like a seal bark? And the parents are like, yeah, actually it does. <laughs> and we're all like seal experts here and know what a seal bark sounds like. Anyways, um, Strider, uh, inspiratory, uh, inspiratory Strider, that's a high pitch um, mm. sound, which I have excellent. Um, examples of, but we won't get here because we can't turn the thing on. So you're just going to have to Google Strider on YouTube and listen to what it sounds like. Uh, congestion, rhinorrhea, respiratory stress, kind of the same symptoms. Um, so distinguishing between other worrisome diagnoses is croup versus epiglottitis versus retropharyngeal abscess. Um, you can see your hand out there are a few different things uh, that can produce kind of an upper respiratory strider. Um, I guess another verse that should be there uh, should be um, a form body aspiration would be another one. So you don't want to have a kid come in, you know, whenever I say that you hear that croupy cough, that's one thing, but then hearing a strider as a kid come in, it's like, oh, that's croup, we'll just give him some, uh, you know, racemic epi and send him on his way, blah, 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 or give him some decadron and see you later. And the kid actually you know, swallow a coin or something like that. That would be something you don't want to miss. So there are some things in the handout to help differentiate between uh, a lot of those different things. So, uh, Wesley Croup score. Uh, this is a risk stratification uh, scoring system that helps kind of differentiate between mild, moderate, and severe disease um, and impending respiratory failure. And that kind of help help you guide your um, treatment and plan for this child. Uh, you know, all these scoring system and risk stratification uh, profiles are great. I mean, you need to memorize them all. Um, Wesley Croup scores the first one we're going to talk about. Uh, throughout the year lecture, I will expose you to more. And then in the emergency medicine lecture, um, we'll talk about a lot of them. Um, these are ones that are, you know, they're, they're well-defined, they're ubiquitous in care, they're research-based, and they're the standard of care pretty much. So. Uh, you know, as far as CYA uh, documentation and uh, litigious nature of medicine, anyways, uh, documenting your croup score and having a lot of research to back up the reason why you did something is very helpful. Um, and I think I have, yeah, I have those scoring systems uh, in your handout. I mean, we don't have to go over them in super detail. I think you guys can read a chart. Um, in this, um, oops. It's all good. It's all works. <laughs> all right. Thank God. Yeah, okay. Um, so mild, moderate, severe, impending respiratory failure, um, you know, has these different descriptions and assigning values to them based on level of consciousness, synapses, strider, air entry, retraction, things like that. Um, and the nice thing about it, too, is it has rec management recommendations um, for it tells you what to do. Which is a nice thing, and there's a lot of different things like heart score systems and things like that uh, that tell you what to do whenever you do it. So I love being told what to do. I don't want to have to use my brain power too much. So Wesley Croup score. So a diagnosis imaging is helpful, but it's not you know necessary. You hear so many kids Strider or that Croupy cough. Clinical diagnosis, but imaging sometimes can help you. Um, so. Your classic steeple sign, this is narrowing um, of the uh, airway there, so it kind of looks like church steeple coming to a point. And I know that looks really thin, but I've seen a lot of kids that have a steeple sign that looks like that that are actually doing breathing fairly well. Um, the, the narrowestness, I don't know if that's the word I just made it up, does not necessarily correlate with the severity of disease, but that's typically what you're going to see right there. Um, let's see, can you no, just mess with your hair. Look, your hair looks good. <laughs> so, steeple sign, crew, test question. I mean, the, these these are these those are those are gimme questions. Those are the ones that you should get right automatically to help pad your grade. So, crew, steeple sign. I mean, you're going to see that at some point in your life. 
Uh, again, you know, you can see how the airway goes to a point right there and kind of backs up. Uh, I've got some great videos before you, but you suckers aren't going to be able to hear them. So, we'll see you soon. <laughs> um, I guess uh, you, the link will work in your own PowerPoint, so you can just kind of do it. Um, it's just kind of talk. It just had a video on Strider, what Strider sounds like, and the croupy cough. Um, but you're obviously going to have to hear it more times and need more patience to kind of get the uh, gist of it down. So. Um, the croup score uh, here, what's the croup score to do, just treat symptomatically. Uh, Decadron is kind of the mainstay of treatment here. Um, it's a steroid, helps decrease inflammation, um, and it, it's preferable over like Orpred or Prednisone or Prednisolone because it has such a long half-life. It has like a three-day, 72-hour half-life which, lo and behold, is the usual length, of course, of disease in fruit. So you only have to give them one dose of this oral Decatron in the emergency department or in the outpatient care setting or whatever, and they're covered for the entire course. That's why it's preferable uh, to other oral steroids. Uh, 0.6 mg per kilogram. Uh, max of 10 is typically what you see in the young kids. Um, so if they're over a certain weight, I can't remember exactly what it is, you just give them. Uh, moderate to severe crew, Decadron, and then, uh, uh, you know, Decadron is always going to be in there. Give them dose Decadron, it's not going to hurt. But then we kind of do a stair strap approach, so Decadron then builds on, on that. Uh, next thing, nebulizer is um, So this is a, a systemic alpha and beta adrenergic agonist, that's what epinephrine is, uh, but it's more localized to the uh, upper airway. And produces relaxation of the sweet muscle, bronchial tree, uh, and beta 2 receptor activation, so helps dilate it as well. So, relaxes the sweet muscle and helps dilate the uh, bronchial tree. Um, and that is for moderate to severe croup, and is usually typically reserved for uh, strider at rest. Um, yeah, it's difficult, you, know, you can use your Wesley croup score to guide your management because it tells you when you need to use racemic or when you shouldn't. It's kind of a judgment call a lot of times. Um, so I typically reserve it for strider at rest. You'll have a lot of crew kids that are, have that croupy cough and when you get in there and you're messing with them, you piss them off and they're crying, then you can hear them have that strider. But when they relax and chill out and they're hanging out with mom, you don't hear that strider. So I don't do the racemic heavy for those kids. I usually for the ones that are just sitting there resting and then have that inspiratory high-pitched strider. Um, the only thing when you use that, um, you have to monitor them for at least two hours. Some of the books say three to four, but two hours I think is perfectly acceptable because you can have rebound effects because its half-life is only about one to two hours. So you give them that racemic epi and it, I mean, it'll, like, it'll cure them. You'll have a kid that sounds like crap and give them that racemic epi breathing treatment and then they sound perfectly fine. They're good. One or two hours goes away, that racemic epi starts to wear off, then it's right back to where they started. So you can't just give a racemic epi treatment. Kid sounds great. It's like, all right, see you later. You need to make sure that that Strider's uh, breathing um, doesn't come back. Another note here, I just said it. Stridorous is not a word. Stridulous is what it is. So strider is the sound of breathing. Stridulous is, I guess, the action form of that breathing, not stridorous. So if you have any opinions or whatever, like, hey, stridorous breathing, like, excuse me, sir, it's stridulous. <laughs> I don't recommend doing that. <laughs> <laughs> So actually it's pronounced stridulous. Okay. Strider is not a word, stridulous. Do you like your job? Uh, you Anyways. Um, so yeah, mud, you have to monitor them for at least two hours. And then if you and you can obviously give them there's I mean there's really not in uh, a set defined upper limit for the amount of racemic epinephrine breathing through which you can give. I mean obviously you're giving them exogenous <laughs> epinephrine, so they're going to be tachycardic and um, have some systemic symptoms of that alpha and beta agonist activation. 
um, but you can you can give them multiple doses kind of back to back if needed depending on the severity of the illness. But you just got to kind of watch out for their heart rate and things like that. If their heart rate is you know, 220, 230, I wouldn't be given another one unless they absolutely really need it. But if you're kind of crossing that point, then you just need to be intubated that child anyways. And so that's kind of what we're talking about now, intubation and respiratory failure, uh, which again is difficult to ascertain. Um, you know, sometimes there's a lot of gray area. It's There's not a lot of, you know, yes, intubating, no, he's good. Uh, that takes a little bit of kind of clinical uh, gestalt, which becomes over time. Uh, symptomatic oxygen, fluids, cold mist, things like that. Bam, 45 minutes. <laughs> Any questions? No? I have a question. Yes, ma'am. This might be stupid, but how often do you intubate? Or do you, like, do you do it specifically? I do do it specifically, yes. Um, how often do I intubate children? Not often. I, I've intubated one kid in five years, or four years working out of Logan County. But that's just because of the area that I'm in. There are not a lot of intubating level kids, acuity level. You know, in, in the city, you do it more often. Like OU Children's Hospital, I'm sure they do it more often. But you know, kids are fairly resilient. There's not a lot of times that they go into true respiratory failure that you need to intubate them for. I mean, there are some, but it's not, I mean, I intubate adults all the time, but kids less frequently. Um, you know, it is kind of, you know, there's a, um, it, 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 you know, it's, it's tough to say when you need to do that because you don't want to get behind the ball and have to intubate a crashing kid who's, you know, peri-arrest and takes you to uh, go into cardiac arrest. Um, but you also don't want to intubate a kid that really doesn't need it and put them on a ventilator because then you expose them to a lot of different opportunistic infections and diseases that could come with that. So it's, it, it's, a, tough, it's a tough kind of thing to say. But typically, children's intubations are fairly... Uh, unless you're like integrating the knee on they're typically pretty easy because their anatomy is pretty well defined on a kid that's a normal kid. Um, so, any other questions? No, I mean, it's pretty basic stuff. All right, I'll see you guys next time. <laughs> no hundred dollars. Sure, well, this is the only uh, presentation I have that uses sound, but I'm sure you can get the next person on the <laughs> <Okay. laughs>